Good afternoon. Uh, well, mo good morning to everyone that's attending our talk today. Um, okay, we've had a few technical difficulties. I apologize for the uh, few minute late start here. Hopefully everybody can see um, the presentation. Um, my name is Robert Williams. I am the Assistant Director for uh, Research and Development here at CMAS. And uh, today I'm gonna be giving an overview of our aberration corrected um, Titan and Themis STEM. Um, I'd like to draw your attention to next month, uh, Dr. Dan Vecti will be giving a talk on large area analysis in the SEM. Uh, that'll be on October 29th. So if you're interested in large area analysis in the SEM, please keep your eyes out and uh, look to sign up for next month. Um, I wanna just briefly talk about what we're gonna try to accomplish today. Um, you know, we want to introduce you to the Titan and the Themis microscopes. I kind of want to make this as useful as possible to a broad audience, so we're not going to deep dive into much of any detail today. Um, and I'll try to keep it as non-technical as possible so you can realize, hopefully, what are the possibilities at CMATS and things that you can do here to help facilitate your research. Uh, for the grad students, you know, hopefully there's some new grad students watching this or observing this so that you can see what we have here. Um, you know, these are going to be the tools that you get to become experts on over the next few years um, and hopefully you can solve problems and do some really cutting edge research with. Uh, to PI and industry people, if you're out here, uh, we hope to show you some of the equipment that we have that makes us uh, a unique institution and sets us apart from other institutions. Um, and we really are a collaboratory. We want to collaborate with you. We have some of the best electron micro microscopes in the world and some of the best electron microscopists um, who do their own independent research. And we're really looking to partner with uh, and synergize with excellent uh, scientific researchers to get the most out of the microscopes, but also solve real world problems. Um, <clears throat> if you have any questions, uh, please submit to the question and answer button below. Uh, and as we go through the seminar, um, do this in real time. Uh, we will try to, um, sorry about that, do this in real time and we're gonna try to uh, Answer questions as we go. I want to bring up the laser pointer, so hopefully we can see. Okay. Um, if you have any any difficulties as well, you can contact us in the chat function if something's going wrong or you can't see um, what's going on here. So, all right. To give a little bit about me, um, my professional background, I, I was an undergrad at Virginia Tech in MSc. I did my MS and my PhD here at Ohio State. Uh, along with a little postdoctoral work. I took a short stint as a research assistant professor at University of North Texas. Um, and then I came back when we opened CMAS and started as a senior research officer here and then have moved on into an assistant director position. Uh, my research interests have basically uh, been in metallurgy uh, for the majority of my career. I've done quite a bit with titanium uh, with respect to aerospace and additive and, and bio. Um, and really what we're looking for is to correlate microstructure property relationships. So understanding how a material behaves and why it behaves that way uh, by using electron microscopes and other uh, characterization techniques. Um, and now it, my job and, and what I'm doing uh, much more is interfacing with industry, identifying problems, uh, and hoping, hopefully creating workflows uh, with our electron microscopes to help um, solve real world problems. Uh, they asked us to put in something fun we like to do, and so here's a few pictures. Um, back bowls with waste deep powder is a good time to me. So when I have a chance to get out west, I try to uh, get out and find some fresh powder to, to snowboard down. Um, something else fun that we do here is uh, have CMAS. So it's our Center for Electron Microscopy and Microanalysis. Um, we house a little over $40 million worth of electron microscopes here. So for the students, this is part of what makes this a unique facility. We have electron microscopes ranging from SEMs up to the highest level aberration corrected microscopes um, that you're gonna get to have access to and learn on. And to industry, um, this is a $40 million investment that most industries uh, can't make. They don't have the infrastructure, they don't have the capital investment, they don't have the people to drive the equipment. And so what we wanna do is provide this for industry as well so that they can come and utilize our resources um, in an efficient and effective manner. And so you can see here our suite of electron microscopes. Uh, if you're looking for doing focus ion beam work or scanning electron microscopy 
or XRD or X-ray CT, um, I would draw your attention to these, uh, take a look. Um, please reach out to us. We're happy to talk about them. Um, you can see also under TEMs here, we actually have a variety of TEMs in-house. Um, today, we're going to talk about our, our Titan and our Themis, our aberration corrective microscopes. We have two conventional TEMs, a TF20 and a, a T30. And then we have two cryo-electron microscopes that we now have um, You that, again, um, we will use for biological work and single particle analysis. Um, so in our facility, we put quite a bit of effort in to designing a facility that will be optimized for these aberration corrected microscopes. And so hopefully if you're in this talk, you, you know a little bit of application of the microscope. And, and one of the things we'll do with these aberration corrected microscopes is try to look at the atomic structure. So we're actually looking at atoms. And in order to do that, we need almost a perfect environment. And so the researchers and staff here at CMAS have spent quite a bit of time uh, in designing this building. And what we designed was a building that has little to no electromagnetic interference. We've reduced our mechanical vibrations in the facility as much as we can. We have a temperature stability inside the microscope rooms of around 0.1 degrees C. And our power quality and availability is, is second to none. We have a UPS that if there are any uh, dirty or unclean power or a blip in the energy source, we can flip onto a diesel generator. We have a flywheel that will maintain the facility for two minutes. And what this means is that our microscopes stay up more than most electron microscopes. We have high availability and we have extreme stability. The other thing you'll notice in this room, the microscope is sitting over here. This is our Titan. And we have a glass wall here with two users operating the system. You as a human being are one of the biggest perturbations on the microscope. You emit heat, you like to speak, you like to move around. So you create temperature instability, you create mechanical vibrations, and these things will be, a, they will affect your image. You can actually see your voice in the image if you talk when you're in the room. So what we've created is a way to isolate the user from the microscope and provide this optimal local environment for our systems. And we see that in benefits in all of our results. And what this provides us is an, every one of our instruments exceeds manufacturer specification. That means we do better than the microscope is stated to perform by the manufacturer. And the reason being is because we have such stable environments. So today's talk is really to talk about the, the Titan and the Themis. And so there's a, a lot of text on this slide, but what I'm doing here is, is listing the capabilities of the system for you. And so this is a nice slide if you want to ever come back and take a glance and see what we have on our systems. Um, there's a lot of similarity between the two, but the major difference between our systems is one is image corrected and one is probe corrected. And what that means is one system is optimized for HRTEM and the other system is optimized for HR STEM. And so I'm going to go through what the, some of our capabilities here and then we'll, we'll talk about what that means more in depth. Both of our systems have an XFEG. This provides a high coherence, high brightness FEG, field emission electron gun. Um, the monochromator allows us to vary the current. So from an analytical standpoint, you are no longer constrained by the size of your aperture. You can real time vary the current that your sample sees to increase signal to noise or decrease dose rate, right? And so this becomes a very powerful analytical tool that most TMs do not have. But along with this, we have a monochromator on the system that provides the ability to reduce the energy resolution or increase the energy resolution to around 100 milli electron volts. So 0.1 EV. Now, if you're familiar with synchrotron and X-ray data, when you collect X-ray data, you have around a 0.1 EV energy spread in your synchrotron data. And that allows you to do near-edge analysis work and look at compositions and bondings. The same thing goes here with our beam. We can now reduce the energy spread, and it really opens up the ability for spectral characterization. Our image-corrected Titan is optimized for high-resolution TM, as I said. We can also perform STEM at a very, very good resolution of around 130 picometers. We have three operating voltages, so we can work at 60 kV, 160 kV, or 300 kV. So now you can vary the beam energy and reduce the damage caused by the beam to the sample and still maintain good resolution. Our pro-corrected Themis-Z is our 
high resolution STEM. And what this means is we can converge the electrons down to a point. And with the probe corrector, we can make that point as small as possible. And in this case, sub angstrom. And now as we scan that point over the sample, we can see how the beam interacts with the sample. This gives us the ability to have a STEM resolution of less than 63 picometers, depending if on your sample. With this system, we can take our energy resolution below the 100 milli electron volts down closer to 30 milli electron volts. And we can also operate at multiple voltages, again, 60, 200, and 300. Both systems are equipped with what we call an S-twin pole piece. Um, what this does is allow a little bit of room for tilting and movement of the specimen. So you can do a little diffraction work and tilt to different zones, get, get to the areas you need. But it also gives you a nice spacing in the, in the chamber for um, X-ray analysis. On these systems, we have what is called the Super X EDS system. This is a four quadrant detector system that allows you to essentially create a, a full solid angle. What that means is we have a very high efficiency for collecting the X-rays that are produced on this sample. So when the beam hits the sample, X-rays are produced. The more efficient, the more number of those X-rays you can collect, the better our signal to noise will be. <clears throat> these X-ray detectors are made up of four silicon drift detectors. So these silicon drift detectors can hold about 125,000 counts per second with essentially no dead time. What that means with four detectors is you can have essentially a half a million counts per second in EDS. Now, for those of you that have performed this technique or have used older systems, you know used to you could only have 3,000 counts per second. And EDS is a statistical measure, so the more counts you have, the more accurate you'll be. So being able to collect half a million counts versus 3,000 counts per second increases the accuracy and the, the quantitative ability of EDS significantly. It also allows us to locate very small doping amounts. So you can look at it from if you have an infinite amount of material, how easy it is to collect signal, or if you have very small amounts of material, we're very efficient at collecting those x-rays. We also have um, yield spectrometers on both systems. Uh, we have a Gatan 969. So both of them have dual EEL spectrometers, which allow you to uh, collect the core loss and the zero loss simultaneously. Um, on, our Themis mic or on our Titan microscope, we also have a K2 direct electron detector. And so we'll talk about some of the benefits that come with that. <clears throat> we have a four segment annular detector on both microscopes. So this allows for ABF imaging and a few new techniques we'll talk about here in a, in a minute. And we also have on our Themis microscope, an MPAD pixelated detector. This is a modern uh, new invention, uh, if you will. It's a new detector that's just come out of Cornell in the past few years. But this allows us now to uh, collect all of our diffraction information. So when you work in a TEM, you typically are using diffraction information and choosing parts of that to create your image. We now have a detector with a large enough dynamic range that we can collect all of our diffracted intensities and post-process the data. And this is really a game changer uh, for electron microscopy. Um, and it will be going forward. Uh, one nice thing uh, that I want to point out to the PIs and uh, also to the uh, industrial partners here, these microscopes are available for review, remote viewing access and also for remote control. And so if you're a PI and you have a student using the microscope, you can be on main campus or traveling internationally and log in and watch what the students are doing and interact with them and help guide the experiment. The same goes true for industry. Uh, this is what we've tried to create as a remote experience that really optimizes the collaboratory, the collaboration effect that we have in CMS. So now if we just go over a little bit of the difference between TIM and STEM in case you're not that familiar with it. In STEM, we're going to focus our probe down to as small a point as possible. So the corrector is above your sample. It's correcting the beam as we converge it down. And it lets us get a probe that is, again, on the order of 60 picometers. And what this means is, as we scan the beam over the sample here, the resultant signal can hit a variety of different detectors. And these detectors can give us different signals. And we'll talk about what they produce. But this gives us what we call a directly interpretable image. You're getting a result from, you know where the beam is placed, and you're getting a result from that region. And you can therefore localize your, your signals. Our Titan is an image corrected system. 
This means the corrector goes below the sample, and what we're doing is correcting aberrations that come from the beam interacting with the sample. This will be where we work in phase contrast um, as opposed to stem. So the images will not be directly interpretable. Um, we'll talk about that on the next slide here. Um, but what we can also do in this microscope is classical TEM imaging. So now you can do dark field imaging. You can use apertures to define diffracted intensities and choose which features you want to look at. You can also um, do classical diffraction contrast imaging and diffraction contrast stem imaging. So these systems are, are really robust in that you can perform stem and TEM in both of them but they have to be optimized for HRTM and HR stem if you choose uh, individual microscopes. Now, when the beam interacts with the sample here, this is a little diagram showing just some of the different signals that can come out, all right? We have signals that come out above the sample, and then we have signals that come out below the sample. And what we now have in CMAS with these two microscopes is a variety of detectors and spectroscopy material or equipment to capture and analyze these signals. And that's what we really want to talk about now, is how we're going to use these microscopes to collect interesting, scientifically valid data that we can then process and pull out some quantitative results. <clears throat> I want to start with the with HRTEM um, and our image corrected system. Um, again, this has a very nice EDS detector. A lot of people use this for STEM EDS. But what the system is really made to do is the highest level aberration-free HRT imaging. And what you have here in this slide, <clears throat> we have two sheets of graphene. So you can see the hexagonal nature, and then above here, it becomes a little bit more difficult to see the hexagonal nature. And that's because the two sheets are overlaying. And when you're performing HRTM, it requires image simulation. You may have heard me just say that STEM is directly interpretable. Well, HRTM is not. As you change the focus and the thickness of your sample, the image uh, will change significantly. And it, it can give you an impression of an atom being in a place that it's not. So we have to have image simulation. And this, 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 or this technique really works best for samples that are under 10 nanometers. We'd like a very, very thin sample. So for people working in 2D materials and uh, depositing thin films, if you're doing any graphitic work, things of that nature, this is a really powerful technique. It also works great for nanoparticles. So catalysis work and chemists and uh, people out there working in that area, you can do very good work in simulation because of how thin and small your samples are. Um, so I have on here um, one of our friends of CMAS who just recently uh, moved on um, this month, actually. Um, Jorg was our... Uh, expert HRTM uh, faculty. He's now moved to the Technical University of Denmark and is the director uh, there. Um, that doesn't take away from any of his expertise and his skill sets. So, um, you know, we would certainly recommend uh, interacting and collaborating with Jorg. Um, but if you have any questions on HRTM, uh, Jorg Jensik and uh, Mike Mills are two of the best people that you could ask here. <clears throat> now, if we transition into STEM, I want to talk about the Themis and a number of the things we can do using the Themis, um, because this is really our, our flagship instrument now, and uh, it's just truly amazing some of the, the data that comes out of the system and how easy it is to get the data out. Um, <clears throat> so what we have on our, our Themis microscope is called the S-Core. Um, there's been multiple generations of correctors, but S-Core re refers to S-Corrector, it's the newest generation probe corrector that uh, comes out of Thermo Fisher. <clears throat> and it corrects up to fifth order aberrations. Um, that's okay if you don't know what that means. We don't need to go into all of that right now. But you can imagine there are various things that affect your image quality. And they, they have different levels, different orders. Normally, we correct to the second or third order. Now we can take it out to a fifth order. You can think of it as a polynomial you know, to the fifth. Normally, instead of correcting just to the second or third order, we're now correcting to the fifth order. What that allows us to do is have a probe where we can increase the convergence angle out to 30 to 50 milliradians. And that is what allows us to get this very small, coherent probe that we can now uh, probe our sample with. And what's really, really neat about this is you can do this at the various voltages. And so you can obtain a sub-angstrom stem probe even at 60 kV. And what we have over here is actually a, a single sheet of molydisulfide. So it's a 2D sheet, <clears throat> one atom thick. 
And with this, we can image it at 60 kV. So we, we're working at a low voltage in order to reduce the knock-on damage, and we can still maintain the sub angstrom resolution and see the separation between the moly disulfide or the, the moly atoms. <coughs> now, if you're familiar with STEM, um, this technique has been around for a while, and what we will call it is HAADF STEM, high angle annular dark field STEM. And what that relates to is the type of detector we're using. And by using that type of detector, it allows us to determine the, or it, it allows the contrast in the image to be determined by the atomic number of the, the column that you're looking at. So what that means is each of these columns you see here has a different intensity. And that intensity scales proportional to Z squared. So we have strontium sitting on the cube positions, which are the brightest atoms here, right? The green atoms. Now, if we go to the slightly lighter atoms, we have the titanium oxygen positions here. So titanium has a higher Z than oxygen. So we see the titanium positions here in the blue. But now we look and we can see in our crystal structure that we have oxygen positions here. If we look in our image though, we don't see any intensity in the regions where we would hope to know where oxygen is, right? And so now this, I hope, is, is <clears throat> ringing some bells with people because one of the things we do and one of the things we know to dictate mechanical properties is oxygen. How does oxygen sit in the, in the material, in the crystal structure? How does it control the mechanical properties? <clears throat> so if we can't see oxygen here, then maybe this technique isn't the best technique for, for imaging oxygen, and we're going to show you a few ways we can do that. Now, one of the, the things we have at OSU is a large number of physicists over on main campus growing films. You know, we do a lot of battery work and we do a lot of memory storage work. And so uh, our researchers like to think that they can grow by atomic layer deposition and, and uh, physical vapor deposition and uh, various methods of growth that they can grow perfect crystals. And while you have methods such as read and and low angle scattering to, to look at the quality of your film, nothing beats the sub angstrom resolution that you can achieve in a, in a probe corrected microscope. And so here we have an HADF stem image of a deposited layer. And hopefully you can see here how perfect the structure is on the bottom. This is the substrate. And then here is where they started growing the film. And you can see we have very odd defective structures. We have these dark regions. Here we have some features that look to be deformed. And if we <clears throat> look a little closer in that region. You can see now, based on the image that I showed you earlier, the strontium tightening positions, we can actually locate dislocation edge on. So if you go back to your microstructure textbook and you drew in a burgers vector around an edge dislocation, this is classical work that we would have seen as a metallurgist. You can look at it from an oxide perspective. But what we can now do very clearly is start to look at and image our defects. And so for the physicists that are growing these films that think that everything is laying down in a perfect order thermodynamically, you start to see there are defects. And now if we can understand these defects, we can actually characterize them and try to remove them. <clears throat> but as pretty as this image is, we really want more information. Some of the things I've alluded to as I'm talking here is what's going on in the dark region? Is there a vacuum there? <laughs> is it a really large lattice parameter? Probably not. Um, so what's going on? Why don't we see anything there? Um, maybe you'd ask yourself, well, is, what type of strain is present around the dislocation or what type of strain is present in the sample? Um, does the dark region, does it relieve strain? So if you could measure strain, can you see how it changes around these defects? And then what I alluded to earlier is where's the oxygen? You know, we, we know there's three species in this structure, but we only can see two. So it'd be really nice if we can figure out a way to image the oxygen um, so we have an idea of where it sits. <clears throat> and what we have to do that are multiple different types of detectors and also uh, spectroscopy at CMS. And so we can start by talking about super XCDS, which we will, uh, and show some examples from that. We can look at EELS, which is electron energy loss spectroscopy. And then we also have our segmented detectors um, to go about. So <clears throat> if I come back to this image now of of strontium titanate. And again, if we look here at our atomic numbers, we have strontium, titanium, and oxygen. So oxygen has a Z of six, titanium 22, and, and strontium 38. So if we think about from a Z squared perspective and you square these numbers, 
it becomes very clear that there's going to be a very large difference between strontium and oxygen. And so what we see here is that the dynamic range in the image can only be so large. And if we're imaging strontium, we can't also see oxygen at the same time. So this Z squared relationship that we're using is not really great for seeing oxygen. If we could find something that was a linear relationship, now we'd have a much better chance of seeing all three species as opposed to in the squared formation. <clears throat> and one way we can do that is by using our segmented detector. And so down here, you can see two different types of segment de detectors. The one here that has the beam on it is just a circle cut into four pieces. So it's like four pie pieces or a, a pizza with four pieces. <clears throat> As you move the beam over the sample, the transmitted disc is going to have fluctuations in it. And this segmented detector can pick up those fluctuations. The more segments you have, the more fluctuations or the more precise you can be in your fluctuation measurement. And so what we have is a four quadrant, and then we're increasing to a, 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 a 16 quadrant detector, I believe. <clears throat> this way, we can be more precise in our measurements. But what it provides us is the ability to perform a te technique called IDPC, Integrated Differential Phase Contrast. And so now, this image that I'm showing on the left here, the contrast in the image is proportional to Z, not Z squared. And so what it allows you to do is pick up very weak intensities in these off column or these oxygen positions. So now, in imaging the strontium titanate, you can see these weak, weak intensities in the red spots. We've imaged oxygen, and we can see clearly where the oxygen is. So if you have tilting or displacements, you can start to see that. We can also use a technique called annular bright field stem. And so here you can see their, their oxygen positions as well. So now we have two techniques that are complementary to the HADF stem imaging that you can use. And when you collect this data that I'm showing here, these three images were collected simultaneously. So now we have complementary data to really start to probe our problem. <clears throat> Another technique that you can do using segmented detectors um, is Lorentz stem. So our HRTM, or our, our Titan and our Themis, both have the ability to do Lorentz TM imaging. And again, with work we're doing with the physics department uh, and memory storage, we're looking at small magnetic fields. We're looking at skirmions and trying to see, can we identify skirmions, image them, and characterize them? And so in our microscopes, we have two methods that you can go about attacking this problem. You can use conventional Lorentz TEM, which doesn't have the best resolution uh, due to how we have to image the sample, but really will show magnetic domains well and has a, a large classical uh, history. <clears throat> But a new technique that we can now apply using these segmented detectors and also our MPAD detector that I haven't really introduced yet is our pixelated detector. We can use these uh, shifts in the transmitted disk to very accurately and with much higher resolution now detect magnetic fields. And this is a technique that we're really pioneering and, and pushing forward with a few other universities. Um, so if there's magnetic imaging you'd like to do, um, this is certainly an area we'd like to um, discuss problems in future work. Another technique that can be used using the impad, um, this pixelated detector. Let me let me reiterate what the impad is in case I, it wasn't caught the first time. It's a pixelated detector, and each of the pixels has about a million counts of dynamic range. And what that means is, when you put a transmitted disk or a diffracted beam on your detector, there's a very large flux of electrons. And classically, detectors did not have the range to um, to not saturate. So when you put this beam on the sample, the detector would saturate. And as soon as we have saturation, we can no longer accurately count or scale what's happening on the detector. The impact detector is a robust um, pixelated detector. So now we can put our diffracted intensities on and record all the diffracted information at each pixel position. These data sets are huge. They can be easily 100 gigabytes up to 500 gigabytes, depending on the size of what you're, you're collecting. But you now essentially have your entire microscope session stored. And so all of the things you would have ever done in the TEM, essentially, most of them, you can do them outside the TEM and post-processing. And so one of those things that we can do now is called fluctuation electron microscopy. And if you're not familiar with that technique, 
what we're doing is looking at the diffracted intensities as we scan the beam over the sample. So here's, here we have a nice sample, right? We have a really nice crystalline region. We have a slightly disordered region, and then we have a more disordered region. What we can do with fluctuation is start to look at short range and medium range order. And so for things like bulk metallic glasses and amorphous materials, this becomes a, a, a game changer in the fact that now you can start to characterize this type of intensity. It also works for polymers and things that damage. So you can see how things change and fluctuate over time. Um, that's where this fluctuation aspect comes in. And so you can see here, if I look through a perfectly crystalline region, I have a nice cubic pattern. As I get into the slightly disordered region, I maintain one order of symmetry, but not the rest. And then as I get into the amorphous region, I now have what we look at as an amorphous pattern. But if you are, <clears throat> are particular about this, there are intense regions in this amorphous pattern. And so now you can pick out these intense regions and start to do analyses and really reveal uh, the nature of the, the short range order and the medium range order um, in these glasses. So <clears throat> again, a, a very nice technique that wasn't possible until we, we um, acquired these direct electron detectors. <clears throat> so just a, a quick summary of some of the things we can do with these segmented detectors. Um, with the four quadrant detector, this will enable us to do DPC and IDPC. So now we can <clears throat> image very clearly light elements such as hydrogen, nitrogen, and oxygen. Um, if the four quadrants are summed together, we create what's called the annular bright field image. So you can have complementary DPC, IDPC, or ABF. Um, <clears throat> And as we just talked about, you can do Lorentz stem with these four quadrant detectors. The impact pixelated detector allows the same type of processing. It, it opens up a few more options. It just increases the data sets. And we don't have really nice software to process everything yet. But as far as collecting robust data, it's, it's one of the best ways to go about doing it. So we can still do IDPC and, and DPC because we have all of the information. With that, we can image or the light elements. We can also do orientation mapping, right? Because we can now collect diffraction patterns, and if we can process the beam or, or rotate the beam around, you can actually collect diffraction patterns and start to do OIM or orientation image mapping in the in the TEM or the STEM. We can do strain mapping. If we can measure diffraction space, we can measure the change in uh, diffracted intensities and the change in lattice parameters. <clears throat> we can do fluctuation electron microscopy. We can do pack bed. We can do Lorentz STEM. It just it's opened up the door of what we can do and how we can process our data. Um, and so I highly encourage you to, to explore the impact, see what its benefits are, and uh, see if there are any experiments that, that you would like to do with this. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the takeaways here is that CMAS is a one-of-a-kind facility. We have, we have awesome equipment that most universities don't have access to um, in-house, and so if you're a student here or a collaborator with us, uh, again, I, I highly encourage you to reach out if you think there's any overlap of your research and our experimental capabilities. So um, if I move here on to spectroscopy, um, I want to talk about SuperX and EELS um, just briefly so that you know how these techniques work and the, the things we have at our disposal. <clears throat> our SuperX system is basically oriented like this. This is your TEM holder and sample. We have four detectors that fill the space around the um, sample. This allows us, again, to collect at half a million counts per second. And so when you have a thin sample, you can see the x-rays that are coming out of it because we have a, a nice solid angle to collect all those x-rays. And if you have a thicker sample, you can actually handle and collect all those x-rays to get really good quantitative counts. So we use VLOX uh, software, which is Thermo's proprietary software, and it has a really nice EDA, uh, EDS processing software and um, absorption correction scheme. So um, this data works out very well and we've seen very good results from it. So here's just an example of the sample. Um, you can tilt and you may have done that in other microscopes to tilt and see one of your detectors for EDS. Here we can collect at zero tilt or at some angle of tilt and still know what each detector is seeing and take that into account. So. <clears throat> Now, if you're asking yourself, what does that provide you? Quite a bit. So if you've ever done EDS work, um, you may know that looking at carbon or light elements in EDS is, is discouraged. 
you would have never actually tried to look at carbon in a sample um, and quantify that in any way because there's no way to collect enough signal um, from your sample. You may have tried it in an SCM where you had large pieces of carbon, but it's still due to absorption and other things that would have been uh, less than ideal. Some of the work we've done um, with Dr. McComb uh, is looking at organic photovoltaics. And so without going into too much depth here, we have a fib foil that has two different types of polymer films. One is a carbon C60 layer, like a buckyball, and the other is a copper thalocyanine. These two layers have a variation in carbon. And what we want to do, and what's important to photovoltaic work, is knowing how electrons transfer across this interface. And so we wanted to be able to, at first, just identify the interface. If you want to look at an interface and you can't see it, how do you know where it is? And so what we could do with our EDS system is quantify carbon and see a variation in carbon in the upper and the lower part of the film, which helped us identify the um, interface to go on and do subsequent work. Now, one thing I don't talk about here is that in order to do this, you have to be able to make a fifth foil that is damage free, essentially. And that is something else we can do. And so, again, to look at polymeric films that are, if we look at the scale bar here, 20 nanometers, so maybe a 40 nanometer film and fib it out and not damage it is impressive in and of itself. And then we could go in and actually look at the carbon content of the film to know where the interfacial layer sits. <clears throat> You can also take things such as um, next generation aerospace alloys. This is some work I did with Mike Mills and a few of the faculty here. <clears throat> if I draw your attention to this region in the center where we have the black box, I hope you can see there are, are bright atoms or bright dots here. Each of the dots you're seeing in this image represents an atomic column. So this is a stem image where we're showing the atom, atomic structure and these bright ones, if you remember what I said, the intensity of scales with Z squared, the bright ones means they're higher in, in atomic number. But again, we want to know what species sit there and what is going on in this defect. And so by doing atomic resolution EDS, you can start to pull out what are the sub lattice occupancies. You can see where the nickel, the aluminum, the titanium, the tantalum sit. You can see the alternating <clears throat> nature of it because of the, the crystal structure. And what we were able to show and prove here is that this matches the eta phase. And this resulted in a nature publication and really a, a new strengthening mechanism for next generation aerospace alloys um, in nickel based super alloys. So, well, replacing nickel based super alloys, I should say. <clears throat> so that's the power of EDS and how we can use that to, to pull out chemical information. We also have at our disposal electron energy loss spectroscopy. Okay, and so for those that are not familiar with this technique, we have the electrons that come out of our gun, right? They come down, they hit the sample. We know very precisely the energy that the electrons have when they come out of the gun. That we, we give them the energy and we know what, they, what they're traveling at. <clears throat> By having a spectrometer down here at the bottom, we can see how much energy is lost as the electron passes through the sample. So you can think of this as sort of a the inverse or the complement to x-ray, right? An electron hits the sample, excites an electron, it decays, and out comes an x-ray. Well, those electrons keep going, that we're firing at 300 kV, keep going through the sample. And when those electrons go through the sample, they imparted energy to create the x-ray, but then it means that electron that flew through lost some energy. We can very precisely measure that energy using our spectrometer. <clears throat> and again, if you think about the energy resolution in our beam, we can reduce the energy resolution in the beam to below 100 milli electron volts, 0.1 eV. That means we have very low energy spread and we can measure the energy loss. And now we can really go on to start to measure things about composition, but we can say things about bonding, coordination, uh, crystal structure. Um, and on our systems, we have two different types of cameras and I can show the results from the two different cameras here. Um, <clears throat> and so it, and I'm also looking at light elements so I'm looking at carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. These are three things that we would typically not really identify very well using x-rays. Now I've shown you with the new systems we can become better at it. But here, with our, our EEL system, we can use our US 1000, our conventional CD, CCD, to collect these red, green, and, and blue spectra. So you see these small sections 
that I have sitting here above the, the larger spectra. These small sections are very, are very good. Uh, up until the direct electron detector and the K2, this was the best we would have achieved. Um, and this is what all the, the literature that you would see on EELs from 2000 and before, this would be state-of-the-art data to collect these small regions. And that means hopefully very quickly, if you look at this, if I wanted to co collect carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen in a single sample, I'd have to collect three scans to see those three edges uh, with this resolution. Our Titan is equipped with a K2 direct electron detector. What this allows for, among other things, is a much larger energy window. And so what you're seeing here in this lighter blue curve that has all cont or continuity through the, the plot, <clears throat> we can now scan an energy window that is 500 EV, or 300 EV, sorry, and we can see both the carbon, the nitrogen, and the oxygen edge. And you can see the same resolution in these peaks. So now, if you've read about eels or you look at classical eels data, there'll be a lot of caveats, a lot of warnings about, well, you know, we had to do this, that, or the other, and maybe the data was collected in uh, discontinuously. Some of, a lot of that fear or a lot of that problem with the data collection has now become obsolete because of these direct electron detectors. The other thing that I would say about the direct electron detector of the K2 here is that the order of time that's required to collect this full spectra is faster than each of these individual spectra um, collections. So um, the K2 has been a game changer. When we combine it with monochromated eels, it really improves what's possible and what we can do looking for light elements um, and determining composition and bonding. <clears throat> this is an example of some data you can collect. Um, so we can look at atomic resolution EDS maps, or we can look at atomic resolution EELS map. And so this is atomic resolution identification of barium titanate and strontium titanate, right, at 80 kV. So we reduce the voltage in the microscope to reduce our knock-on damage, and we can still maintain our image resolution, like we've shown with the probe corrector. And now you can very clearly identify your barium titanate versus your strontium titanate interface, right? And you can put these beautiful maps together. <clears throat> what makes this so impressive is that we're mapping out at very high energies, so or over a very large energy window. So strontium is occurring out at almost 2,000 eV. Titanium occurs at 450 eV, and oxygen occurs at 500 eV. About what we have in one scan is a large enough energy window that we can collect all this data simultaneously. And again, when you're collecting data, what we're going to want to do is collect it as simultaneously or concurrently as possible because you don't want to have stops in the microscope or stops in the scan or changes in regions, right? <clears throat> now we can do complementary EELS and EDS um, data of the same regions and show the power of that technique. Uh, just to explain the monochromator a little bit to those of you that don't know, and to explain what I've been talking about here, I guess, uh, having a smaller energy window or energy resolution. If you bought a, a, a Techni or a, a normal TEM, the energy spread of a standard uh, source is going to be around 1 to 1 1.2 EV. If we come in with a standard FEG, the standard FEG, we have a, an energy resolution of around 500 milli electron volts or 0.5 EV. With our XFEG mono, you can see here with the blue how much smaller the width of the, the Gaussian is here. So we come down now to around 0.2 to 0.1, so around 100 to 200 milli electron volts. By reducing that spread, then when we look at our, our spectra, it allows us to bring out more features. So this is looking at a carbon edge. And if we look here, we have diamond and graphite, amorphous carbon, down here to different types of carbon. And if you look at this, this is X-ray synchrotron data. So I've spoke about that a few times. And the energy resolution here, I'm, I'm sorry, this is TM data. Um, the energy resolution here is 0.45 EV. Um, if I draw your, uh, your eye to this pink region or the red region that I, I have highlighted, you see that as I go down all these different spectra, there aren't any peaks that look of importance. There's our signal, or our pi star peak here. <clears throat> now, if I look at something that has an energy resolution of 0.1 EV, 
which is again what we have um, when we monochromate our electron source, and I look in the same peak region, now I can look at polymers and I can actually pull out a large number of peaks, as many as seven peaks that occur in this small energy range, right? So this is what happens with the improvement in energy resolution and how you can characterize things now with 0.1 EV resolution that were not possible using previous systems. <clears throat> the cutting edge of this is to go even lower. And so I mentioned that with um, our monochromator on the, the Themis, we have Ultimono. And Ultimono refers to an even better energy resolution. And so now the system has been modified. There's been some technological improvements. And what that means is instead of getting down to one or here, 0.2 EV, which is this, this is what we'd have on our, our Titan. If we go to our Themis, we have the ability to get this really thin spectra that's just almost a line. That's around 30 milli electron volts. When you can get down below 30 or into the, the 10 range of, of um, electron energy, <clears throat> now you can start to probe vibrational spectroscopy. And if you're reading the newest literature or looking at nature and science, this may be some of what you're seeing. There's some data that's coming out now where we're showing that you can actually look at vibrational nodes and vibrational spectroscopy if you have this type of energy resolution uh, with your spectrometer. And again, one of the strengths of this is the ability to have this energy resolution and then have the same spatial resolution. So now we can control this um, in a local fashion. So I want to finish up here. Um, at OSU and at CMAS here, we have the best of both worlds. We have an image corrector and a pro corrected system, and it really provides great flexibility for you if you're trying to do research. Um, both systems are, are powered by EELS and EDS. Um, <clears throat> again, what you want is more than just a pretty image. You want compositional information and, and hopefully bonding information. And so now we can do that using super EDS and EELS. Um, we have a very nice uh, set of faculty here. Uh, our director, Dr. McComb, uh, is a world expert in EELS and electron microscopy. Uh, Professor Fraser is a world expert in aerospace and titanium metallurgy as well as electron microscopy. Uh, General Wong is a STEM uh, expert and has <clears throat> really pushed the application of these microscopes and the, the techniques that we're using and applying to further levels. So for some of the newest techniques, he's a great uh, contact to work with. Um, we have Vicky Doan Nguyen, who is uh, more of an x-ray person, but also uses the, uh, the electron microscopes. But so from a synchrotron and an energy, uh, uh, or a uh, energy resolution standpoint, uh, she's great. <clears throat> uh, Mike Mills is the chair of our department now, and also an aerospace um, professor. He has worked in electron microscopy, I think, for 30 years now, uh, if not more, and again, um, an excellent resource. And then if you're working in electron microscopy and you don't know who David Williams is yet, um, we suggest you look at the Williams and Carter textbook, which is our seminal textbook that we use uh, and most universities use to teach TEM. So we have a really nice suite of uh, faculty here that really come together to help make uh, everything sing and are here for you to uh, ask questions and you know contribute to the research um, so with that I'll finish up um, you know we have hashtag Seymour with CMAS when you're here in the facility collecting data we highly encourage you to um, share your images uh, you know these microscopes take beautiful images and your science is really pretty as well and if you ever take anything even if you don't think it's the prettiest thing in the world maybe you just submit it to our uh, one of our sites here so that we can take a look and uh, you might see it on the, the CMAS webpage as we promote you and your research. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions um, and I hope this was uh, informative. So thank you for your time. <clears throat>